Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Manager with Tricom. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to the staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Robert Thompson started his career as a principal at a marketing firm focused on market research and analysis of the staffing industry. He has worked with dozens of firms, including worldwide, since 1989. He co-authored one of the first staffing industry risk management manuals in 1995, which is still in use today. In 2007, he joined Worldwide Specialty Programs as a vice president, using his 23 years of staffing industry experience to run their new business, broker development, and workers' compensation division. He is an experienced manager whose skills range from marketing, research, analysis, sales, customer broker relations, to underwriting and loss control. He is from New York and has four grown children. Some companies provide staffing insurance. Worldwide Specialty Program provides peace of mind. Their focus, goal, and mission is to protect your staffing business. Worldwide has dedicated the last 50 years to knowing your business understanding your risks, and providing you with the best, most innovative staffing insurance solutions available. They know firsthand the challenges facing today's contract staffing firms and partner with you to help you build a stronger, more resilient staffing business. With their deep and broad knowledge of how your industry works, Worldwide has taken their commitment to your, your industry further than anyone else in the staffing insurance industry. They track developments and ensure that the staffing industry is armed to address changes protected with the right fit insurance products and services. In today's webinar, we will discuss workers' compensation and the things you need to know. A well-managed workers' compensation program allows a staffing firm to create a competitive advantage over their competition by retaining higher profit margins. Uh, the staffing firm needs to know um, workers' compensation coverage, including client selection, hiring temp workers, company philosophy, carrier underwriter variables. And by the end of today's session, you'll know how insurance providers make assessments and how to position your staffing firm to qualify for modification rate discounts. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A or the chat feature located on the right toolbar. At the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. With that, I will turn the floor over to Robert. Thank you very much, Amanda. I appreciate your time. And thank you, everybody, for spending a, a little time with me today. Um, first off, I want to thank uh, Julianne and Shelley and everybody at Tricom. Their commitment to the industry is really unparalleled. Um, to be able to put the time and energy and resources into giving everybody um, this kind of information uh, is really great. Um, I am the uh, Vice President of Worldwide, as Amanda stated. We have over 5,000 staffing firms that we represent and, and insure currently um, this year. With that, we have probably 200 on the comp side and the 5,000 on the package side, which kind of shows a disparity in how difficult it is to write workers' comp in this marketplace. So uh, let's see if we can go to the next slide. The, the slide that you're viewing right now is, a, is an illustration, and, and the reason why I wanted to start with this, is to get everybody an understanding of how the, the workers' comp market works. For every dollar that's, that is spent, only 5% goes, to, or the expectation is that 5% will go to the carrier. You see the 65% where it says lost payout? That 65% is comprised of one number, and that is the loss ratio. So let me give you an example. If you have a $100,000 workers' comp policy, the premium, 
and you have a $50,000 loss, the expectation is that that $50,000 loss will triple, three-time multiple, in terms of development over the course of the life of the claim or claims. So on a $100,000 policy, if $50,000 is your claim, the expectation is that $50,000 will develop to $150,000, therefore you'll have a $150,000, 150% loss ratio or $150,000 in claims against the 100 in premium. A carrier is looking for you to stay within the 20, low 20s, high teens. So that means if you have a $100,000 premium, they want you to stay in a 18 to $22,000 in claims for the current year. So most people don't understand. They say 40%, 50%, 60%, the carrier is still making a lot of money. They aren't. 30% of those costs go to commissions for your brokers, administrative fees, and then only 5% really goes to the carrier. Currently, most staffing market workers' comp marketplaces are averaging 112% loss ratio. That is why it's so difficult to get um, workers' comp carriers to insure this industry. So I want to give you a little illustration as we go forward how important it is to make sure that you keep your loss ratio and your losses at a minimum so that way you can reduce your workers' comp costs. So in our my years, we deal with almost 1,200 brokers that bring those 5,000 accounts to us. Of those 1,200 brokers, uh, when we talk to them on a daily basis, the one thing that we find is the biggest challenge is client selection. Um, it's imperative that you pick a good client. Um, now, We've seen many of these. I go to a lot of state conferences. I go to 14 of them in, in support of all the state associations, and we find that in many instances people take jobs to, you know, for cash flow. They need the jobs. They're not looking at the clients, the details that we're going to talk about today. To have, have selection protocols in place. Make sure that when you're looking at a client, what are the things that that client brings to the table other than just a job and an invoice? They must be financially sound. Please make sure that they are financially sound. Ask for financials if you can. Sometimes you feel that you can't, uh, but if that's possible, get them. Um, when you do your sign uh, um, location visits, site visits, look and see how the place is run. Is there a safety conscious um, environment? Um, is it well run? Is it clean? Um, are there things in order? Is there stuff all over the place? Try and get a feel for whether they're financially sound. Um, look and see if there's a safety-conscious environment. Do they have safety meetings? Do they have risk managers? Are they looking at claims? What happens when a claim happens? Um, what can they do to help fix um, any potential hazards that are in there? Are they proactive about fixing hazards when they go out, um, uh, when you're going through the warehouse or the location? Are they proactive in trying to get things done? There are ways to look at the client loss history. Um, we, we like to have this question asked. Of course, it may be difficult. We certainly understand that. But if you have a good relationship, maybe you can get these. Um, understand the client's EMOD. That's experience mod. That is the, the number that um, gives um, us an indication and, and, and a rate multiplier on how to figure out everybody's rate. It gives you an idea. So if one is the average number, Anything below a one is good. Anything above a one could be a little more challenging. And certainly, if it's in the one, three, four, five, even two or higher um, range, you know that that person has some losses, and you should go in, um, you know, with both eyes open, trying to make sure that they have their safety protocols in, in, in line. And they should be reporting their, their injuries. So if they have OSHA logs, please take a look at them. When you go to the client location, um, if you do not have a, a, a checklist today, there are so many available to you through your broker, through your carrier, um, all over the Internet. Um, there are so many opportunities to get checklists so that when you go into a client location, make sure you understand them, make sure you look at them, and see if there's anything that you can do when you walk through a client location to make sure that they're understanding and they're showing you where your temp worker that you're going to place is going to be working and maybe sometimes how to work the machine or how to work the location or how to navigate, so that way at least you know. Um, and if they're a good client and they have those safety protocols in place, 
they'll have no problem in showing you um, the location and what your client's going to be doing and act the actual materials or machinery that they'll be working on. The next one, know the codes, incredibly important. The biggest source of loss for us is people going in to a job, they're going to be a warehouse worker, picking and packing, and then next thing you know, they're driving a forklift. The, the jobs that they're hired to do, and then they end up, while they're there, they want to impress the boss, so they go and do whatever other jobs they're asked. Make sure that there are protocols in place so that if they're asked to do a job, to do a job that they were not hired to do, make sure that they can call you and somebody at the staffing firm or have a liaison so that they can discuss it to see whether that move makes sense or not or whether they're trained for that move. So it's imperative that we, we work hand in hand, not only with the temps that you're putting in, but also with the clients so that, um, that the codes that you're going to work in, you understand the training that's needed and that you understand that, that you have to in, inform your temp workers that they have to be able to um, communicate with you if the job is changing. Um, we see many, many, many firms that don't have their handle around it, and next thing you know, injuries occur because they're doing something that they were, they were not trained to do. Next. The hiring of temporary workers. Of course, that's such a, a, a big portion of this business, um, not only client selection, but we're, we hear, as I travel around the country, we hear um, one thing. I got a great job. It's a million dollars, a half million dollars, whatever the number is, and now I got to figure out how to fill it, and it's tough to get temps to fill the jobs. So what happens? You fill a job with anybody that you can, just to fill a job request. That is a trap if you can, and of course, that's your asset, so you, that's what you're trying to do. Please make sure that the person that you're hiring the job for, we look at this all the time as a comp carrier, we look at are they hiring and do they have um, um, protocols in place that say here's a job, these are the physical and mental requirements to do this job, and can they hire a body that matches that person, mat matches those requirements? Um, the best way is to make sure there's written instructions on what all the job duties are, uh, make sure that there is some training and that you can document it. Here's a, a, a quick side fact. ASA um, and the staffing industry have been, ASA is American Staffing Association. Um, they're, in case you don't know who they are, they're like the legislative watchdogs of the staffing industry. Uh, and they do a great job for, for the staffing industry. About a year and a half ago, OSHA came in and targeted the staffing industry and said that, um, that they believe that the injuries are more prevalent in the staffing industry than in the normal or in the regular um, uh, standardized workplace. I actually am on the OSHA committee at World um, at uh, ASA, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be in the first meeting with the Assistant Secretary of Labor, Dr. Michaels. So we had many of us in a room down in Washington, D.C., and the first thing that he said was, the first day of a temporary worker's career should not be the last day of his life, which is a pretty tough statement to make. Um, the insinuation, of course, is that temp workers die and are killed on the job at a much higher frequency than other, other markets. So they are mandating, and they're going into many, many companies now, and we're seeing a lot of fines out there, and it is just on the bottom of the bell curve. It is starting to rise, and you will see more and more of it. And that is one of the benefits of listening to somebody that is that's out there and doing this every day. Um, just like ACA was a big factor a couple of years ago, and of course it still is, but when it first came on and nobody was aware of it, today you will see OSHA taking much more of a presence in your client locations and your own locations. So make sure that there is written instruction um, for every job that they're doing, make sure that you have um, training and that you can confirm training that's being done and make sure that you get it down and you qualify it um, and make sure that that training is being done for those jobs and make sure the candidate that you're hiring is qualified based on the job requirements, uh, job requirements that are uh, needed to do that job safely. 
Okay, so safety programs, incredibly important. We see, we ask for safety manuals. Um, safety manuals come in many risks, uh, many uh, sizes and shapes. We see some that are 500 pages and some that are one page. We don't really care how big they are as long as they are comprehensive. Um, so when you're going into a, whatever carrier you're looking to go to to get your, write your workers comp, they want to make sure that you understand what the risks are that you're going to be putting your temporary worker in, in, uh, in, that, in that exposure and in that hazard. So look at the safety programs. If you are not uh, savvy in that, um, you should have a good broker. Uh, you should also have a, a good carrier that has an understanding, and you can feel free to call them. Um, call them, ask them, say, listen, this is what I'm getting. Is this something that you think? Is there something else that makes sense? Um, any suggestions I can give to my client to, to get a better safety program in place? If, much like what I said in the very beginning about client selection, if you find elements and weaknesses in a safety program, generally they're not a safety-conscious firm, and if they're not willing to make any uh, changes or, or accept any recommendations on how to do it better, uh, that, that's a pretty good indicator on whether um, your temp is going to be safe in that environment or not. Next, owner or risk manager buy-in. If Certainly if the owner is not involved, um, you see risk managers and vice presidents and, and people that are in charge running the facilities. If they're not buying into the safety protocols that, that, that you think should be in place, or that your carrier or broker thinks should be in place, um, red flag. Try to make sure that there's an open communication between the owner, risk manager, and yourselves so that there's a buy-in and they understand that, that ultimately safety comes first because you will be, be, believe me, you will be in a difficult position if your mod goes from a 1 or a 0.7 to a 1.5, and just so everybody understands what that means, that $100,000 premium example I used earlier, if your mod is a 0.7, then your $100,000 premium would end up ultimately, you get a credit, would be 70,000. The reverse, where there are issue, claims issues and injury issues, if your mod is a 1.5 or a 2, that means that your $100,000 workers' comp premium will be multiplied and will be $150,000 or $200,000. So think about the, the, the weight that that extra cost has to carry in your margins to make this a viable program for you to run. And, it's gonna, and I've seen many, many staffing firms go out of business because they cannot handle the cost, the, the very difficult cost of workers' comp. On-site supervision. We're very practical here. We understand that on-site supervision is a cost, and in some instances you can't do it. Um, so if you can, where applicable, it's always great to have, so that way you, the temp workers know, your workers and the, your placements know that they have somebody that they can go talk to and, and uh, deal with. Um, certainly, whether it's not on-site supervision, at the time that the jobs are being done and the workers are working, at least have some on-site um, approvals, on-site supervision prior, so that those, um, those, the areas where they'll be working will be safe to work at training program for all jobs they are hired for. Um, I don't think it's realistic to, for you to train every single person in every job that happens, okay? We all understand that. Um, but it is important that you know that they will be trained properly. It is important if they're driving a forklift that you check and make sure they're certified. And if there's any jobs that they need certifications or licenses for, that you make sure that they're current. Um, if they're driving, that they have a valid driver's license. If they're driving a forklift, that they're certified. And if they're handling any other kind of uh, materials, power tools, machinery, make sure that they're licensed and not only capable of handling it, um, but they're fully trained on it. One of the key things that I'll, I'll get into a little, little deeper at the end of this presentation is broker-carrier relationship. Um, I deal with almost 1,200 brokers. Of those 1,200, there are probably 50 that really have their hands around the staffing industry. Um, most brokers handle life insurance, car, boat, house, home, and, and a staffing firm or two. 
That's not to say that they're not good brokers. They could be very smart, very educated, and very, and, and very bright. Um, but they generally don't have staffing industry knowledge or great experience in it. So, um, and we deal with them all the time. So we're willing to help train them, get them on board, and let them know that we're here for them to try and help them. But your carrier um, has to be able to give you data to help um, as you're looking to make placements in certain areas your carrier and your broker should be there to support you and help you make decisions if you need them um, for what codes you're going into, um, what areas you're going into. Most good brokers or carriers will be able to give you, have some kind of dashboard that will be able to give you injuries, um, claims, loss ratios, down to the zip code. And the code itself, so if it's uh, clerical or electrical or warehousing, um, they should be able to tell you the, the losses down to the zip code, literally. If you're in Southern California, that's bad. Southern California is probably one of the, and I'm sorry if you're any Southern California staffing firms are on the phone today. Um, sometimes the sins of a few um, are taken on by all. So, but South, Car South California is probably one of the toughest parts for, an insure, for a, a work comp carry to insure in the entire country. Um, the claims and the frequency is so much higher than in any other area. So if you're in another state or you're in another part of California, look to see um, how your rates are going to be impacted. So your broker or your carrier should have a lot of this information for you. So uh, please do not be afraid to ask about it. It's very, very important. And you have so much available to you out there, please utilize it. Claims meetings. Any carrier worth their salt will allow you to have claims meetings. So make sure that you or your broker um, mandate that they have to have some claim, whether even if it's one, have a claims meeting, go through it. The key to closing up um, and keeping your costs lower are keeping your settlements and keeping your claims low and under control. So the more you have interaction with your claims um, and the more you have interaction with your carrier and your broker about reducing the time of those claims, reducing them, the payout of those claims, you will be much better off. It will impact your bottom line in a, in a much more positive way than if you do not handle it and if, you do not, um, or if you're not proactive with it. One of the biggest factors that we see um, in terms of high mods and larger costs, workers' comp costs, is a thing called lag time. Claim happens on January 1, and it doesn't get reported till March, or it doesn't get reported till January 18th or January 10th. When you have a claim on January 1, it should be reported January 1, January 2, right away. You need the carrier involved immediately, your broker involved immediately, so that we can address it and put it to bed and get people back to work and active again. Because if you're not doing, if you're not trying to get them back to work and you're not trying to get these claims addressed immediately, you will find those claims will linger. You will see the, the amount of attorneys and litigation increase incredibly um, the longer it goes on before it's addressed, um, before it's reported. If an, if an injured worker starts to get in and starts talking to everybody else in the warehouse, listening to who got this claim, who got that claim, who got this settlement, you need to address it immediately and make sure that your carrier and their claims teams are on it right away, it will absolutely bring your, co your workers' comp costs down. Um, unfortunately, it's a rampant problem with the entire industry, but if we do it one staffing firm at a time, decrease that lag time, you will see great, great changes uh, within the industry. If you can have a risk manager or safety director, that's awesome. Um, a lot of staffing firms, the risk manager or the, the uh, safety director are doing something else within the company. In smaller firms, we get that. But if you have a safety director or a risk manager that's experienced, while that's terrific, um, make sure that they're up to speed on the, the newest and latest information. And for instance, our carrier Zurich. So we have the ability to give anybody, a safety director, risk manager, any client, a ridiculous amount of materials on safety, on protocols, back-to-work programs, OSHA regulations. So
so that we can help educate anybody that's handling that risk management or those safety director positions. There's so much information out there. We can give it to you. Your carrier or your broker should be able to provide it to you. Um, if not, it's, the Internet is, is just uh, lo loaded with it. So if you have any questions, and if, certainly if you're working with, uh, with Julianne and, Shel and Shelly, or you, whether you're my client or not, you just call me, uh, send me an email, and I'll try and get you any information that you can. Because the more information, uh, like they say, knowledge is power, the more you know, the more you can prevent, the more risk engineering that you put into your company, the lower your mod will be. And outside of payroll, workers' comp costs are the, the largest line item in your balance sheet. So um, if we can help you reduce those costs, that's what we're here for today. Good working environment. In dealing with thousands of claims, um, thousands of clients, and listening to the, the tale of woe on many of them, one of the things that we see, claims are lower in a good working environment where people respect each other, people feel there's a, they're treated like human beings and they're treated well. Claims are fractions, fractions of what other firms are that are more uh, hostile environments, don't feel people are treated the right way, not a good working environment, not a pro-employee um, culture. So if you can make your working environment a much better one or a little more pro-employee, you will absolutely see people that want to work with you are less likely to have a little cut or scrape reported and turn into, uh, you know, thousands of dollars worth of claims. And let's remember, today in, this, in the medical marketplace, claims that, that are were, you know, $100 10 years ago or $5,000 today. So there's no broken pinkies that, that cost $500 a set anymore. Everything, the medical costs are off the charts. Um, the prescriptions, care, they are out of control. So um, the best that you can take care of your employees proactively, you'll be in a much better position. Know what you're getting yourself into. Um, there's so much data out there to inform you about the codes that you're going into, the hazards, the geography of them. So if you're a clerical account and you want to go into light industrial, maybe if you learn about it, there's, that the opportunities are there. There's some financial opportunities. That's great. Um, we just had somebody that, as an example, um, they had a million dollars in, in clerical and they wanted to go into two million into medical, um, but they had no experience in medical. So that's a danger. That's a flag. If you don't have somebody that knows it or you don't know it yourself, um, if you're going to go into it because financially you need to, that's great. But please make sure you do your homework because one of the, one of the biggest causes of loss that we find is staffing firms going into codes that they're not familiar with, um, they don't understand the training of, they don't know the potential hazards, and they're in situations that are very, very difficult. Things like driving travel nurses, um, oil and gas, some construction codes. These are all flags that you're going to see on any carrier that you go after. So if you're going to go in them, there are some firms out there that handle them beautifully, and they understand the risks, and they understand the hazards, and they, they plan for them, they train for them, and they can handle them wonderfully. But if you're not one of those firms, please be aware. Again, uh, I stress throughout this call, talk to your carrier. If you have the opportunity to figure out what codes they don't want to write or a restricted code list, try and get it because that's really important to make sure that um, they're on top of all the codes and all the injuries throughout the country and use that knowledge to help make your company run a little bit more efficiently. I see probably 125 submissions a month. Uh, and in January and July, I probably see in excess of 170 a month. We write less than 10% of them. So sometimes we write between, if I get 150 submissions, I'm writing six, seven. Um, and there are reasons why. And here are some of the reasons. Um, the mod. The reason why somebody has a high mod. Um, the mod, you would think, gets raised to offset the losses, but not really. Um, you're going to see in the industry, if you went to the state NCCI or the state workers' comp bureaus, you are going to see state rates dropping in 41 of 50 states. 
That is the standardized workers' comp rates are dropping in general across the country. Now, that sounds great, but not in the staffing industry. In the staffing industry, you're still seeing debited, debited policies by private carriers because the exposures, and they're not getting the, the rate for it. You have a clerical code, uh, 8810, and you're looking at California, and it's uh, you know dollar ten or dollar fifteen. Um, in Massachusetts, it's nine cents. So there's such a disparity in state. While a warehouse is a warehouse is a warehouse, and somebody picking up a box is the same in California, and Massachusetts. The bottom line is you can't get rate for certain things in some states that you can in others. And even though the rates are dropping, you are seeing um, debits increasing, which means that. For every dollar, they're charging you $1.20, $1.40, $1.60 um, for that rate. So the reason that is is because if you're having a mod and you're seeing debits on the rates, you're also getting the mod as a multiplier. That multiplier we talked about earlier, um, the experience mod. So you could be looking at uh, what you think is a standardized premium of $100,000, and that's what your expectation is. And then once the mod gets added, and once uh, some of the debited codes that you're in get added, then all of a sudden you could be looking at $200,000 for that same premium. So um, if you manage it correctly, you'll be able to really work it, um, work the numbers and make sure that you're in a very productive and profitable uh, marketplace. Loss ratios we talked about in the first slide is imperative. Every carrier looks at it. I look at it. When we understand one claim, um, you have a severity claim, what we call it, it means it's one claim, you have a, a good program and there, there's not a lot of frequency and you don't have many claims, you're having two, five, three, one, um, that's awesome. And you have one blow-up claim, I take that into consideration and we look at it and we say, okay, this is an accident, we understand, that's why insurance companies are in the business to help you when there are accidents. So we just don't want frequency. We do not want those bad, those those common things that when we continue to go forward, um, the claims happen time and time again. So the loss ratio, um, which is for us, we look at the amount of premium you're paying versus the amount of losses that you're paying out. So if you're starting to see yourselves on the on the wrong side of that, you need to do something. Um, speak, like I said, speak with your broker and your carrier and make sure that. You can do whatever you can, and some of the things that we're talking about today will help you bring your loss rate, will bring the claim rate down, your, manage your money, and bring your loss ratio down, which will ultimately help bring your workers' comp costs down. Bad losses. Everybody's going to have some losses. 1,000 here, 1,500 here, 2,000 there, we get it. Um, close them out quick, and, and you're in good shape. Get everybody back to work. The bad losses where somebody hurts their back, breaks in a leg, or breaks an arm, um, God forbid, is, it's, or worse than that, make sure that you stay on them. Make sure that you get them closed quickly. Open claims are killers. So if you can close them quick, that's, a, that's position A. Make sure that you're discussing this internally. Um, I've seen a lot, of own, a lot of staffing firm owners that have had bad mods and they – they, they, they found uh, angels, and they decided that they got to do something and fix it. And boy, oh, boy, when they get involved and they start calling on them, I'll give you a quick example. Recently, we had a claim a few months back. There was a, uh, a woman that was working in a, a saw, a machinery environment. She was working on a, a, like a, a saw that cut paper, and she went into um, – the job, she went in, she goes in, gets working on a machine. Um, an hour later, all of a sudden, there's an ambulance, and she almost got degloved on her entire hand. Huge, huge claim, huge injury, felt terrible. They go to the hospital immediately. The doctors respond immediately, um, and, and there are costs immediately. So you have no control. The carrier has no control. By the end of the, the second day, you could be $100,000 into that claim, um, before you even found out about it. So what happened was there was a video, and she undid the guard, took the guard off, and attempted to put her hand towards that blade three or four times before she jumped by accident and it got caught, and she did it to herself. It was a complete fraudulent claim. 
But right now, that claim is worth $700,000. And that is impact, going to impact that poor staffing firm because that woman was a serial um, workers' comp claim um, person. She's had six different, different staffing firms that she went out and had cl she put claims in with. And this particular time, she made a mistake. She blew it herself, and she ended up hurting herself um, in, in a much worse situation than she could have in, in, uh, if she just got her, uh, just left the, the, the guard on and didn't try to be a fraudulent um, participant. And, and everybody's screwed. Everybody's in trouble now. Everybody's got problems. And for the staffing firm, because they did not look at, at that woman's history, they didn't do a background check, they were not checking their, their employees that they were putting out, and uh, they did not look and be proactive on a big claim, they, they left it, and $700,000. Now, of course, they're not, we're not paying any more now that we know it's, it's fraudulent, but it's still $700,000 in, 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 in a claim, and that's gonna impact them terribly. So, carrier loyalty. What are the, I'm sorry, exposure, I apologize. Um, that goes kind of um, in, in, in hand with the codes that we talked about in the prior slide. Make sure that you have um, a handle on the exposures because if you don't, you do not know the, the potential hazards and people are gonna get hurt. So we look to make sure that you understand and that you're compliant and that you have your hands around the exposures that you're sending your, your uh, temporary works into. The other thing we look at, we look at five-year uh, history. We look at five years worth of, of premium and payroll and, and exposures and losses. If you're going from carrier to carrier to carrier year after year just to try and save a, a couple of bucks, um, there is no history there. If you're with us a couple of years, you will be able to, to look at and we'll be able to say, listen, we understand this was just a one-time shot, uh, severity claim, or they put these things in place and this was a non-work-related claim. Um, we had a claim uh, a year ago where there was a construction site, person was, was hurt very badly because a car that was driving on the side of the road actually cut through a fence, hit a, broke open a fence, a locked fence, and hit a worker and injured a worker and broke the person's back. Now, very, very big claim, but it was not a work-related claim when I say work-related, it wasn't something that he got hurt on the job doing his job. So we took that into consideration because we knew that they, and we followed them, we were partners for years. We knew that, they, that their, their uh, protocols were in place and this was a freak accident. So we were able to work with them and help them uh, even though their mod might have increased. So um, if you have carrier loyalty, um, make sure that you try and stay if you can. If you're bouncing, that's a bad, that's a bad habit. You may save a couple of bucks today but, uh, and jump with a carrier. And listen, there are not that many out there. Um, there were some big guys out there for many, many years. There's really only a couple of big A-rated carriers left. Many of them have dropped out. Um, there have been five major A-rated carriers that have left the staffing industry in the last two years. So you're, there are some regional guys out there, and of course you have the state pools, but there are some regional guys that jump in and out of the market they want to make some, make some money, and they jump in and out um, over a couple of years. But the, the A-rated carriers that have been in the marketplace for many, many years really look for that carrier loyalty to, to, to take care of it. As I stated earlier, claims are going to happen. Injuries are going to happen. Uh, accidents will happen. We get it. We understand it. So what we don't want to see and what we ask for is what they call cause and correction. What we don't want to see is... The same injury happening. We don't want to see a claim on Tuesday where a person lifted a 90-pound box, uh, and then on Thursday it happened again, and in two weeks it happened again, and in two months it happened again. Identify the injury, understand what happened, fix it. Cause and correction. We get that claims happen. We're okay with that. It's you know things happen. We want you to be as careful with it going forward. Of course. We want to be as proactive to prevent them, of course, but if they are going to happen, um, make sure that there's some correction that you're putting in place so, so you, you're making best efforts not to have it happen again. So it's a tough market out there. Um, workers' comp rates, like I said, um, while they may be dropping around the country, they're in, they, you're seeing increases in the staffing industry. They're debiting uh, crazily all over the country. Um, 
but there are many things you can do to help yourself. Um, your carry, most people do not use their carry or their broker effectively. Most people don't use their relationships effectively. For instance, you have a great relationship with everybody on this call with Tricon. If you don't really know if your broker has any history or you don't, you're not really sure who your carrier is or you're not familiar with it, ask, ask Julian, ask Shelly, is there somebody out there I can talk to? Uh, call me. My, my contact info I'm sure you'll have at the end of this, uh, at the end of this webinar. Call me. I, again, because you're, you're, you're part of this Tricom um, family, I'll help you any way that I can. So if you need advice, if you need help, if you need direction, we'll do the best we can to help you out um, and, and give you some questions to ask your carrier and your broker to make sure that they're handling you properly um, and make sure that they're handling your claims properly and that they're giving you the best advice that they possibly can to make sure that you are really doing everything you can to keep your, your costs as low as possible. So um, everyone should have a plan. Every carrier should have a plan, and every broker should have a plan for you. Um, if you decide to take advantage of it, you would be amazed at how much information they're willing to share. Um, I have a dashboard that has over 100 points of information. That 100, those 100 points represent lag time, areas of the country that are injury, have injuries, what kind of injuries happen. I know when you come in to me, if you're going to put a warehousing job in South Dakota, what kind of injuries are going to happen in that area and what kind of, what kind of uh, facilities are out there. If you're going to be in New York, I know the same there or the same in Florida. We know in many instances what's going to happen before you do. It's, we see the loss ratios. We see the amount of claims. We probably have the largest database. We certainly have the largest workers' comp book, um, but we don't just use our information. We use the information from not only the industry, all of Zurich, and all of the industry, to evaluate where these claims are and where they're happening. So there's so much data about your individual loss picture and about the industry loss picture and about the code, the codes that you're using out there, access it. Some people don't want to be involved in, in being an insurance guy, but if you're a businessman and you want to reduce your costs, especially on the workers' comp side and the injury side, then um, please use the tools that you have and see if there's anything that you can do to help reduce them. And we're here for it if you want it. So I um, wanted to run through this quick, so I left some questions. I know that I do a lot of these webinars, and the questions that, that come up are very pertinent, so I wanted to leave a few minutes to give some questions. So I threw a lot at you today. If there's anything that you want to, want to uh, get further information or dig down, drill down any deeper, just send me an email, and I'll do the best I can to answer it as quickly as I can for you. So uh, I'll open up the floor to some questions. Okay, so we do have a few questions that have come in. Uh, the first question is, um, is there a way or how would you get a copy of workers' comp codes and rates for their particular state of Missouri? Okay, so um, first, the easy answer is on the Internet. Um, but the state, every state has a workers' comp bureau, a workers' comp board. So you can get information from the workers' comp board. Um, your carrier should, so I'll give you three answers. One, generally you can find them on the internet. Two, you can call the state workers' comp board. Um, in Missouri, in Missouri, the phone number is 573-751-4231. And you could go and get some information from them. Um, sometimes the workers' comp board is a little challenging to uh, manage uh, in terms of uh, phone calls and hold time and all that. So your carrier could easily get them to you, and so can your broker. So any one of those four, four avenues, you should be able to get the, the, the questions answered. Okay. Do you know of any workers' comp carriers that can assist a new staffing company uh, because they're a new company, they have zero claims, and their mod rate is 1.75. Looking for any ideas or options that you may know of for them. Okay. Well, a new company shouldn't have a mod yet. It takes, it takes a couple, a few years, three years to generate a mod. So if it's a brand-new company, um, the mod should be a 1. So if it's got a 1.75, maybe there's more... Uh, maybe there's something else there. Um, generally, 
most carriers will not look at a workers' comp company without three years' experience. So generally, they, are, they go into the state pools. Um, sometimes they go into PEOs. Um, I don't always, you know, you really need to do your diligence about uh, what's a good PEO. There are some PEOs that are good, and there are many, many, many that aren't. So um, be careful about where you go. Um, if you're in a single state, you might be better off going into the state pool immediately. Um, I don't understand why there's a 1.7 mod on a startup. So that, uh, unless it's uh, combinable with some other company that has a 1.75 mod. So, but um, if you want to give me some information after the webinar and send me an email, I'll see if I can help you out. Great. Could you explain the debited code again? Sure. So it's not necessarily a debited code. What it means is that somebody, if you have a, um, an electrical code, for instance, and it's a dollar, um, that means, and you have $100,000 in payroll, they take that code and they multiply the $1 code times 100000 in payroll and then divide it by 100. And they, that's how they come up with the, you know, with the number, right? So if, they, if it's a more difficult code or what they considered a more hazardous code, they will put, the carriers will put a debit on it, meaning a multiple uh, or surcharge, as you may call it. Um, so it could be a 20, 25 percent. Every state has individual charges that they can add up to on code. So, for instance, California, you could go up to 50 percent. Um, Illinois, you can go up to, you know, you, it's very small. In New Jersey, it's 20 percent. So the states are all different in terms of what they can debit, you know, debit the codes or debit the premium to raise the, um, the premium cost. Okay. Uh, if you have any other questions, go ahead and submit them. And at this time, can you um, give any just overall um, takeaways of things that a staffing company owner should really think about or, or have a real good understanding of in, in an effort to reduce their workers' comp costs? Well, I think that um, really probably the, num the number one thing is uh, – that we see is cash flow. And when you start dealing with the bigger firms, you know, the, uh, the Randstads and, uh, you know, and the Robert Halfs and, uh, you know, the Yo's and the Elwoods and all those kind of guys, they have this under control. They step back and they say, hey, I don't, I don't want this job. Um, we do not see that on the small to mid-sized firms. We do see it on some better run firms. We don't see it on all. So one of the biggest issues we see is that, okay, choose, this is a, this is a, Fifty, you know, five hundred thousand or a million dollar, two million dollar opportunity, um, but the place they're sending them into is a hellhole, and they do not want to walk away. There was an ASA board member that recently shared with us they they walked away from a Sony because in some of the which is a huge account, um, and it almost put them out of business. But they had to walk away because the claims were so high, the they they could not really handle this account anymore. Um, so sometimes you got to walk away from some big, big jobs or, or big paying jobs. You may want the cash flow, but the cash flow today will impact in losses and increased costs later on today, uh, later on. So, um, okay. Uh, what does constant to rate mean? Okay, uh, it's consent to rate. So okay. in some, it's okay. So in, in some, in some uh, states, they have what they call consent to rate. So the rates are fixed. So let's take Florida as an example. There are certain rates in Florida that, or New York, the rates are what they are. In, you know, in Massachusetts, the rates are what they are. Um, you can't add those, those surcharges or those debits that we talked about. You're not allowed to add to them. So in Florida, they have consent to rate, as in a few other states. That means that I could add a, anywhere from a 1% to a 70% or even higher, I guess, but 1% um, to a 70% multiple on top of your premium. So if I add, if you have a $100,000 premium and I'm adding a 30% consent to rate, I'm adding 30% to that cost. So um, not every state has it, only some do, but, um, and you should check that because that is that is the staffing, um, the uh, insurance carrier's way of getting um, additional premium for the exposures that you're putting your temporary workers in. 
some of the okay. some, um, do you have other questions? Because I actually have some questions that generally um, um, come up here. Yeah. Um, one is what can we do to get status on our claims? Um, you these claims meetings and and calling the you you should be able to get on the phone with your adjuster and find out if there's claims and what the status is on them so that um, you can make sure that you can help manage this. So do not be afraid to get on the phone, ask for a claims meeting, and ask for the adjuster to be on the phone for some of the claims. Okay. Now, in follow-up to that last question, so um, what he's saying is this is what I'm hearing about some lawsuit in Florida, which is affecting their rates in August of this year. Yes, there is a there there is an issue right now. So um, the what was the ruling came down. We I was just in Florida. We were just speaking about this. Um, the FSA Florida Staffing Association had a had a conference, and we just had and we just had a, a, a panel on this exact topic. The rates are going to be increased 17.1 percent. So uh, there was a conflict and and a lawsuit about um, attorneys' rates and what attorneys can charge. And what's happened now is, and quite frankly, you're gonna see more than that in Florida. So in August, although it is now, they have just recently stated that they, it, they looked at the filing, so it may be pushed back till September, um, but all indications are that it's gonna happen between August 1st and September, a 17.1% increase, uh, and you may see an additional increase in the state of Florida come January 1. Wow. Okay. Now that gives, that's a that's a and that's a great question because the, the brokers that we had on our panel in in at, at, in the Florida Staffing Association conference, all those guys were very up up to speed on that exact all the details of that suit and that that new um, ruling. So that goes back to what I said before: um, a savvy, a good staffing insurance broker has to really know the nuances of the states that you're in to help you. Okay. Um, so I've been in business for over three years. Where do I find out what um, his experience modifier is? Uh, your your broker can do that. Your broker will be able to find out for you. Okay. And did you have any other questions? Me? Yes. Yeah, did you have any other um, questions that you typically hear that uh, you could share some answers with with the group here? Sure, Amanda. There, there are a couple that generally come up. Um, sending, when, it, when an employee gets injured, um, we see a lot of emergency room visits. Um, it is always beneficial, and there are zillions of 24-7 uh, care, care centers out there. Um, if you have, especially if you're in a regional area, um, try to develop a relationship with a medical facility that's in your area near your facilities so that you can send an injured worker. Of course, if it's, if it's something that's very serious and they need to go to emergency room, so be it. But most, most claims are not serious in nature. So send them to a medical facility like one of the 24-7 places. Uh, go there. Talk about the rates. Talk about what it costs to get things done. You'd be amazed how flexible they are in terms of the cost. A broken arm or a broken pinky may cost um, one number in Missouri and another number in Florida, or even better, it may cost one number in one town and more money in another town. That's two miles away. So try and go in there and say, okay, these are the injuries that could occur, and see if there's a way to negotiate, and make sure that your clients, uh, your uh, temporary workers go to those facilities. You will see a dramatic difference in medical costs. So, very important. Um, we also that's see a common question. I'm sorry? And so that's a great suggestion. Um, risk engineering. Most, most carriers, not all, most carriers have free risk engineering available to the industry. So, some of your brokers have it. Um, you can find a ton of information on the internet, but if you're going to look for a carrier, try to find a carrier that can help you give you free risk engineering. What that means is they'll come in, they'll, they'll come to you, they'll get you on the phone. In some instances, they'll go to one of your client locations and give you advice on how to better manage um, 
the risks that you're putting your temporary workers in into. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I don't see any other new questions that have come in, but I do have Robert's contact information on the screen. Uh, feel free to reach out to him by email or phone if you have additional questions, uh, or you can reach out to anyone here at TRICOM and we can get you connected as well. Uh, so with that, um, just uh, keeping in mind uh, our time here, I will close out the webinar by thanking you all for your participation and for your questions. Uh, and certainly, uh, Tom, uh, Robert, for spending your time today and providing um, this very informative webinar on workers' compensation. We will have a recording of the webinar available on our website at tricom.com. It is under the Industry Resources tab. And if anyone is interested in copies of the PowerPoint presentation, you can email either myself or Robert, and we'd be happy to send that over to you as well. Uh, so thank you again for your participation and for your time, and watch for information on our next webinar session next month. Thank you, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.